Welcome you today as we begin our February celebration of Black History Month at Monta Vista Grove Homes. The theme of this series is how the Black church worship informs American Black culture. We're in a time of transition here, so we're still a bit cautious about COVID, but gradually and always with hope, moving toward more in-person gatherings as a community. We ask your patience with our, our new workings of technology and, um, and those of us who are still learning it. We're very grateful that you can be with us today. Our beloved resident, Catherine Hughes, has graciously arranged for and invited all the speakers for this month's convocation. She intended to, uh, to introduce her friend, Reverend Kamal Hassan, to us today, but regrettably, she's undergoing medical observation and is unable to be here. I know you will pray with me for her well being and hopes for her return to us very soon. Today, we're going to begin with a scripture that Reverend Hassan has, has recommended, and it's Romans 10 11 through 17, and it's from the Contemporary English Version. The scriptures say, no one has faith, no one who has faith will be disappointed, no matter if that person is a Jew or a Gentile. There is only one Lord, and he is generous to everyone who asks for his help. All who call out to the Lord will be saved. How can people have faith in the Lord and ask him to save them if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? And how can anyone tell them without being sent by the Lord? The scriptures say it is a beautiful sight to see even the feet of someone coming to preach the good news. Thanks be to God for his word. Please pray with me. God of all creation. God of all people, we pray to become worthy stewards of your creation and in service to your people, wherever and however we encounter one another. Help us to not see what divides us, but unify our hearts as your beloved creation and community. We seek your healing hands to mend what we have torn asunder in yesteryears and today, guide our feet to preach and to practice the good news that leads others to have faith in the Lord. We ask your blessings on Reverend Kamal Hassan, his family, and those he touches in his ministry. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Barb, would you just say a word about the chat function for questions so people know how to interact with Reverend Hassan at the end? Yes. Those who are viewing this at home, uh, please use the chat function that you can find at the bottom of your screen in order to address questions to Reverend Hassan. Um, I think if, if, the, if you are in Marwit Place viewing this, uh, unfortunately, I don't... Well, Edgar, are they able to respond to the Q&A or no? no. I think it's, I think that's probably not, not possible. Not if they're in not Marwick. In Marwick. No. Not if you're in Marwick. So, um, but those of you who are from home, you can certainly uh, ask your questions of Reverend Hassan in the chat. Thank you. And today we're so gr glad to welcome uh, Reverend Hassan to Monta Vista Grove Homes, where where two members of this beloved community, Catherine Hughes and Glenn Jones, know you well. There may be others too, but on behalf of those who don't know you yet, we look forward to meeting and to learn from you. Thank you for joining us today, Reverend Hassan. Well, uh, thank you for your gracious prayer and the hospitality that I have received as I have uh, joined with you today. I'm prayerful with our dear friend, uh, Catherine Hughes, um, 
who sent me an email today to indicate that she was in hospital and uh, was being looked after. So we certainly pray for um, a full recovery and her, her return to uh, the fullness of her life. Um, I am Reverend Kamal Hassan. I serve as pastor at the Sojourner Truth Presbyterian Church in uh, Richmond, California, which is here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been serving at Sojourner for about 14 years. It'll be 15 on August 1st. Um, and I also have just started uh, teaching at the San Francisco Theological Seminary here in San Anselmo uh, in the polity class. I was invited and, and uh, uh, was pleased to accept the invitation to come and share with you tonight, uh, generally on your theme of Black worship, but specifically around the practice of Black preaching. And I have uh, given a title for my presentation called Get Up and Say a Word. Mm -hmm. uh, you've heard the uh, scripture that has been kind of guiding my thoughts around this, asking questions about how can people know to believe if they have not heard? And how can they hear unless people are sent to proclaim? And how can there be proclamation if there is no preacher? And given that there is a preacher, and that there is proclamation. And as we say uh, in one of the six great ends of the church in our book of order, that the first one is the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, right? That we believe that if the word is rightly preached, rightly read, rightly heard through the power of the Holy Spirit, it absolutely has the power not only to change lives, but to change the very world in which we inhabit. And so what I'm going to be talking to you about for the next 40 minutes or so is the practice of preaching that is specifically identified with African-American preachers. And there are a few ways that I want to look at this with you, but one of the first things I was asked to do was to talk about preaching in the context of African-American worship. And so I wanna spend a few minutes talking about that and then looking at specifically at the practice of preaching. So I don't know how many of you happen to have seen the movie Beloved several years ago. Oprah Winfrey and Danny Glover were two of the people who starred in that film. And it was a screenplay that was adapted by a novel by the same name by Toni Morrison. And it was a story about the lives of several people who had lived during the time of chattel slavery. It was about people who were enslaved during that time. And it was kind of gathered around a particular incident that actually did historically happen, where a formerly enslaved woman who had escaped the plantation and taken her children with her uh, found that in the place where she had gone to escape the slave condition, she was noticed that her former owner had found out where she was and they were coming to take her and her kids back to the plantation, back into bondage. And so she decided after gathering up her children that she would rather take their lives than have them return to the horrors, to the horrors of chattel slavery. And she actually succeeded in taking one of the children's lives before she was restrained from doing further harm to any of the others. So what Morrison does here is to have the 
ghost or the spirit of the child who died come back to her mother and their family after they had been freed from slavery and were no longer in its clutches. And so a lot of things happened when that vehicle. But there's a scene in there of a secret worship service that takes place way far out in the woods. And Bea Richards is the actress who plays a character by the name of Baby Suggs Holy, an enslaved woman whose body had been badly broken by her experience in slavery. But on Saturday afternoons, when it was warm, she would go to a place called the clearing. And at the clearing, she would preach and there would have worship services far, far away from the gaze of the enslavers who would not have wanted them to have these gatherings. It was not uncommon for enslaved persons to steal away to Jesus or steal away home after their workday. In the wee hours of the night, they would go far out away from the house of the enslavers who were asleep and have their own worship services. And in these services, they would have persons who would be the preachers, who would bring a word of encouragement, a word of reanimation, a, a humanizing word that challenged the dehumanizing effects of slavery. And in these services, there were certain features that took place and carried over even now into many African-American worship gatherings. One, it was a place that was outside of the gaze of white America, where people who in their regular daily lives faced dis discrimination and disrespect, who faced violence and threats, who, who faced the negation of their humanity, within these spaces found solace and affirmation, found encouragement and healing found not isolation, but community. Some came to these gatherings for worship, grieving the loss of loved ones who might've been recently sold. Some came carrying fresh wounds from beatings. Some came hungry because they never got enough food. Some came ragged because they never got enough clothing and or they never got shoes all of the things that they didn't have, although they were making the enslavers rich, they had so, so, so very little. Some of them were children who didn't have their parents any longer. And somehow in these gatherings, these hush harbors and these ring shouts and these secret services, they had encounters with God that were mediated by the presence and the power and the words of black preachers. I'll close this part by saying, the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman would tell a story about his grandmother who was enslaved and who was a witness, a presence at these very kind of secret services that I'm describing now. And she said that 
there was a man who was the regular preacher at these services. And she said, whatever Bible text he started with, he always ended with the same three sentences. Didn't matter if it was the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, didn't matter if he was focused on the Psalms or the Proverbs, didn't matter. Whatever, whatever text he started on, when he closed the sermon, he said the same three sentences. And they were this, you are not slaves. You are not in words, and he would say the word. And the last one, you are children of God. So here, surrounded by all that said no, by all that said they were not human beings but property, by all that said they had no autonomy, no, no right to determine what happened to their bodies, no right to have their children and protect them and rear them, no, what, no right to live unto old age in their loved ones, no matter what the powerful said from plantation to seminary to the offices of government in these states. No. You are not slaves. You are not in words. You are children of God. And you have a God-given identity that is above all reproach. So the experience of Black worship continues even today to make the same three points and Tell us again that we are the Imago Dei. We are children of God. Beaten to death by police officers, but still children of God. Having our history stripped out of AP courses and even out of the College Board SAT test, but we are still children of God. That's the experience of black worship, rehumanizing the dehumanized and setting the captives free. So, so when we think about black preaching in the context of all of that, I think it's important to understand that we have to start with something, knowing something about the African cosmos knowing something about the sacred wisdom and the sacred practices of Africa. Because this foundation that was carried with our ancestors who were kidnapped and enslaved came with them. These cultural practices, these sacred understandings came with them and infused the formation of the African-American sacred history. So let's look at a few of the um, aspects of the African sacred cosmos that became regular features of black worship and especially black preaching. So there are many cultural groups on the West African coast from which uh, people were taken and enslaved and transported from the western coasts of Africa to, into the African diaspora and, of course, to the United States. But there are certain cultural unities and cultural similarities that, this, that the uh, societies from these, this region shared. One of them is this, the, the, the idea that even if they had many uh, lesser gods, in, in most cases, but not all though, but in most cases, there was a notion that there was a supreme God 
who was the creator and author of all life. That was a common belief. Although many, most people in these places were non-Christian, they still had a, a, a belief, an idea in their sacred cosmos that there is a supreme God who created all things and that God is good, more to be loved than feared, right? This is not like the Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. This is a different kind of sacred cosmos in which God, God is light and God is the light of good. So that's one thing. There is a supreme God, even though there are water gods, there are nature gods and many other kinds. There is, however, a God above all who was the creator of all life. And that God means people for good and that God is the light of good. So that's one feature from the African sacred cosmos. A second one is a Swahili word, nomo, N-O-M-M-O, -M -M -O, nomo which translated into English means the power of the word, okay? In this idea, this sacred notion is that words actually have generative power, that words can create reality, that words can have powerful effects on human beings, but words can also have powerful effects in the world of the sacred that surrounds human beings. And that words rightfully and powerfully spoken, as we picked up in our denomination on that first thing I said, you know, the proclamation of the word for the salvation of, man, of mankind, of humankind, that words have the power to create reality. And so people who use words must be careful to use them rightly and with good intent. Because it also, of course, is possible to use words wrongly to have dangerous consequences. So there was a belief in Nomo that words had power. Um, a third aspect of the African sacred cosmos was the office or the of the work of someone, something called a griot, G-R-I-O-T. A griot was a person who was the keeper of the stories of the people. So in a particular society, let's say we are the Fon people of West Africa, there would be a apprenticeship workers who learn to memorize the historical myths and stories of the Fon people and could discipline their memories from the creation of the Fon through all of the years up to the present day who could sit and recall these stories and tell them during the particular times when this was asked for or needed. So the griots were like walking libraries who contained in their memories and in their bodies the sacred history of a particular people and regularly throughout the life of that people would tell these stories so that each generation would know who they are, when they started, how they started, what have been the important historical events in their people's history, and therefore be able to understand their own history and identity. So it's said that these griots could remember hundreds of years of, of history, maybe not necessarily be, being able to recall certain parts at certain times, but they would tell a long tale that starts with here are the creation myths that we understand as to how our people came to be in this place and who the first people were. And they would go from there all the way up to whatever the present time was. And so this was uh, 
a practice that younger people would learn to do so that as the older ones aged out, the younger ones would learn and then continue to tell the tale until the next generation that they passed it on to. Then the last thing I want to say about carryovers from the African sacred cosmos is this sense of a pan-spiritualism. What do I mean by that? I mean that in the African sacred cosmos and also typical of West African African cultures, there's a belief that the spirit of God or the spirit of, di of the divine exists in everything and in every body. Not just the human world, but the non-human world. That animals carry the spirit of the divine, that trees and rocks and rivers carry Okay, I'm back, y'all. My battery, <laughs> my battery on my Mac died. Didn't know I, I should have charged it. Okay, <laughs> I apologize for that. So I try to remember where I was. Uh, so as I was saying, um, the um, the belief was that there were spirits of the divine in all things in all of creation, in mountains and trees and eagles and uh, buffalo. Um, and so that the spirit is an animating agent whenever anyone wants to engage in a, an important cultural practice, okay? And it's also important to, to, to note that um, this sense of the religious or sacred life in these cultures was something that was lived out from the time you woke up in the morning until the time you went to sleep and even while you slept every day. And one of the goals of your life was to seek to live in harmony with the spirits of all of creation around you. And that when you engaged in rituals, including dance and drumming, including uh, singing, that the, the hope that you were exist, that you were reaching for was to do those things in such a way that the spirits would come and take hold of you and direct what you are doing and enlarge what you were doing so that it's no longer you, but it's the spirit. Spirit possession was actually a goal in cultural performance because it wasn't just art for art's sake or art to make you feel good. It was art that would connect you to spirit. And as that spirit took hold of you, then you were capable of performing things that were beyond your individual possibility and capability. That the spirit could get all up in you, right? And take you over 
and speak through you, even though you might not have in, have intended for for that to be said, that something could take over and make of you what it would, such that what would happen is not just your own will, but beyond your will, what the will was for the divine, what the needs were for the community. And so that you would be used as an instrument of spirit and of the divine. And if you could not reach that level, then you had not really done what was required or expected of you. And so when we think about Black preaching in this context, we know that in the presence of the finest Black preaching, all of these things are evident. They're all evident. This notion that the spirit takes hold of the preacher and that God speaks through the one who stands up to proclaim. This notion that their words have generative power, right? That the words of the preacher can actually take hurt people and have them receive healing, frighten people and instill in them courage. Disappointed people and infuse hope into their very bones. This is what we witnessed in the preaching of Martin Luther King Jr. during the civil rights movement. Preaching to people who had been water holes, bitten by dogs, beaten down by, by Jim Crow segregation, impoverished, and through the words that he spoke and the way that he spoke and the way that the spirit took hold of him. People found courage they didn't know they had. They persevered in ways they never thought they would or could. And they were able to perform feats of justice and truth far beyond their own expectations. These things were a part of the survivals and the continuations of the culture. This notion that God is the light of good. Society may, may, may mean evil, but God is the light of good. And the griot as the keeper of sacred stories tells us again from generation to generation, from baby Suggs Holy during the chattel slave period to 2023 on Sunday services, when we recall again the list of those who have fallen to police murder. How do people who enter the sanctuary with their hearts broken again and their faces tear stained again, their hopes dashed and betrayed? Again, there was a time when we felt, oh, well, if we just had more officers of color on the police department, then these things wouldn't happen. Wrong! What do, believe, what do we believe in now? This was the task that is constantly presented to black preachers who don't have the luxury as many people in other contexts do of saying, oh, well, we don't preach about social and political issues. No, you, you, you better. <laughs> Cause if, if, if we don't know what God says about all this, then, then what? So one of the features of, of Black preaching is we have to talk about what's happening in society. Amen. In the finest uh, ex examples of Black preaching, we are talking about 
what's going on in the world. Because we don't have other places to go where institutions support our well being and tell us what we need to know for our survival. Because the institutions in this country are racist, they're white supremacists, and they operate to reward and punish people based on the color of their skin. And if we do not have a place where we can go, where the reality of our lives is on full display, outside of the gaze of white America, then, 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 then we're lost. But the fact that for four centuries, we are still here and still pushing is a testament to the power of black worship and black preaching. So let us continue on. We have a few more, we have some more things to say. I know I'm mindful of the time. Um, so part of the mission, one of the central missions of black preaching mm -hmm. is to redeem the lives and bodies of those who have been dehumanized, right? And, and immediately, when Christianity was presented to us during enslavement, there was a problematic there. Because in most cases, when, 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 when enslaved Africans were evangelized, the form of Christianity that was generating that or leading that was one that was a theological support of enslavement where the evangelists and the preachers particularly if people were taken to the churches where enslavers attended on sundays and and forced to sit to sit in the back or in the balcony they couldn't be where the white people were sitting. And invariably, uh, the sermon would switch over and focus on them. And they would be told, Paul says, slaves obey your masters. Don't steal from your master and mistress. Don't be lazy and follow their orders with a smile. It was God's will that your master and mistress would be enslavers and you would be enslaved. And you should thank God that you can become Christian so that when you die, you can go to heaven instead of hell. But while you live, <laughs> keep, your, keep, keep your mind on the fact that God wants you to be a good slave and that running away is an offense to God. That was the form of Christianity. That was the majority theology that was taught to the enslaved and was stamped with approval by the enslavers. And I have to say, although regrettably, that the Presbyterians were some of the ag most aggressive and most successful in the foundation of the theological and ecclesia eccle ecclesiological support for a slave religion. If you read the book, What Kind of Christianity, Slavery, anti-black racism and the Presbyterian church by William Yu that just came out last year. He gives damning evidence 
of how Presbyterian ministers, Presbyterian moderators of general assemblies, Presbyterian professors at Princeton and Columbia Seminary and pr president of these, of these institutions, and some of the wealthiest people in the country at the time who were Presbyterian were some of the most vicious in spreading the gospel of enslavement both North and South. So what happened, the miracle in all of this, which is evidence of the humanity, spirituality, and genius of Black people was that they took that slave theology and turned it on its head and found instead of a, a Christianity with no gospel, because it is not good news to the poor, that slave supporting Christianity was not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said the spirit had taken hold of him. Oh, the spirit took hold of him? Where did we hear that before? <laughs> In Africa? <laughs> The spirit took hold of him and anointed him to preach good news to the poor. Well, you know, that pro-slavery theology was not good news to the poor. It didn't set any captives free. It did not help the blind to recover their sight. It did not let the oppressed go free, nor did it proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It was a gospel-free Christianity. But somehow, these enslaved Black people, these enslaved Africans, took the same Bible and said, wait a minute here. I see another story. Didn't, didn't Jesus hear, didn't God hear the cries and prayers of slaves in Goshen? and send Moses down there to tell old Pharaoh to let my people go? How come our enslavers never told us about that? No, this is, this is the Christianity that we're going to preach outside of the white gaze. Yeah, we may stand there when they're watching us with our heads all like that and like we all, we, no, but but when we get way down yonder by myself where I couldn't hear nobody pray, then I'm going to pass on this gospel that was like what Howard Thurman's grandmother heard. No, you, 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 not, you are not slaves. This Bible right here says, you are not in words, you are children of God. So black preaching is rooted in this, the finest. Thing. Now you can find all kind of black preaching, you know, both good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> in the finest of the black preaching tradition, this is what it does. It exposes the lies of society and says that black lives matter. It rejects the Christianity uh, the gospel free Christianity and embraces and teaches the main biblical story that God is on the side of the oppressed. That story that's repeated from Hebrew Bible down to Revelation, whether it's the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Greeks and the Romans who have their iron feet of oppression upon the people of Israel, they are saying again and again and again that God refuses to anoint the building of empires and stands 
in the empire's collateral damage and beckons us come and find the Lord there. That's the miracle of black proclamation and what it has done from one generation to the next to give bread to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothing to the naked and companionship to the friendless. Identifying the wrongs and ills of society, not pretending that they don't exist. Because you, what did James Baldwin said, not everything that is admitted can be fixed, but nothing can be fixed un unless it is first admitted. Mm. That's a good statement. Our, 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 our job is to admit it. Because <laughs> we're finding now, you know, in, in, Christian, in Christendom, uh, less and less willingness on the in, in in these evangelical spaces and other conservative Christian spaces to admit that they're that things are going wrong. They want to tear it out of the school books so the children can't even read it. <clears throat> Let's go on. I, just a few more minutes now. In fact, I, I'm gonna close because I, I know I'm at time. So I just want to sum up here. Uh, when we talk about black preaching, <clears throat> we're talking about a practice that is the minority report. It's hard to find, but it still exists. It's not in the mainstream because it's too disturbing. Because one of its highest intentions is disturbing the peace. The negative peace that pretends that if you don't talk about what's wrong, then it's not, then it'll go away and everything will be fine. Don't say anything about racism. It makes people racist. Black preaching doesn't, cannot afford that. We have to disturb the peace. We're also, as a practice, wanting to um, enter into the deep and profound human issues and struggles of life that other spheres in the culture shy away from. It is this legacy, it is this truth, it is this task that is the purpose for which God sends to tell the things that the people must hear because unless they hear, they cannot believe. And if there is not a preacher, then they cannot hear. But if they can hear, then they will know of the power and love of God. And it's with that, I end my remarks today. And I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Well, Reverend Hassan, thank you. This has been a, a sacred uh, presentation. Um, and I've been following the chat along the way. And even though we're on Zoom, let me tell you, there's an amen corner at work. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you've gotten multiple exhortations to preach it, brother. Come on, keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's an important part of Black worship and preaching is the call and response. Yes. The preacher says something, the people got to talk back. So the pre pastor knows, okay, I'm on the right track. I'm saying something that matters. Yes. So and, I, and, I appreciate that. Thank and, you. And, you. and you have been, Reverend Hassan, and we appreciate that. First, a word of apology to all of you who are on Zoom. And that is uh, twice during the past hour, uh, the power has gone out in... Um, the comments here on campus where Edgar has been uh, functioning as host for this Zoom. And I've been getting texts along the way from some of you saying, what, what, what's, what's happened? I've lost the connection. Um, 
So it, it, it's an apology in terms of a technology that goes beyond anything that can be controlled here at Monta Vista Groves. It's just that we've had two power interruptions. So, but, but we're back on and even for those of us who have missed a few minutes of your presentation, we still um, are inspired by the spirit of, of what, you've, what you've said. Uh, let me try and, and uh, connect a couple of things that, that you've brought up uh, with a contemporary illustration that we uh, experienced even as of yesterday. You mentioned the importance of these steal away moments for, for the slaves to get away from uh, the eye and the ear of the, the slave master. And in those worship services, one of the functions of the preacher was to name the suffering, yes. uh, to give voice to the lament um, yes. and the importance of that, to tell the truth about the horrors of the oppression that, that were taking place. And then just to connect that to this, um, the, the importance of the griot, the one who carries the stories. And, and as, as you were presenting, I thought to myself, well, we have witnessed that uh, with Reverend Al Sharpton uh, in uh, his eulogy at George Floyd's memorial service. And then yesterday at Tyree Nichols, could you say more about the importance of, of the naming of lament as a step of experiencing the spirit's uh, presence and healing. Yes, yes. So a couple of things I will say. So one is that um, one of the things that empires are always trying to do is, is to control the narrative and to, to silence dissent and criticism and to hide the histories of harm that they have engaged in. And so you have in many, you know, uh, church settings, folks who, who, who never speak about things like this. I've had, you know, um, people that I know who, who are in majority culture churches where when things like what happened to George Floyd, uh, never, it's never mentioned from the pulpit, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, things that like happened with Tyree Collins, not a word, right? As if these things are actually figments of people's imaginations instead of real things that happen in everyday lives. Yeah. And so, and so that's an important part to it. The other is, what empires like to do is to encourage numbness in people so that you no longer feel the pain. You may have it, but you know, it's like a social Novocaine where it doesn't, you don't feel it, right? So, and we're, you know, we find ourselves often trying not to cry, you know, not to cry out. Uh, not to show emotion, you know, particularly in, in, in what, the way we think about being male. And so then we're distanced from our feelings mm. and, and, and the wholeness of being a human being, mm. which is like, you, we do hurt and we do uh, have pain. And the other part to that is when you lament, you count your losses, you, you say, you know, we lost something right here. You know, the fact that this person has died has changed our history. These are not like stepping on ants. These are human beings who, have, who were making contributions and still had contributions to make when they died so violently. Think about the fact that Dr. King and Malcolm X died at 39 years of age. What if both of them had lived to long life, had lived long? What would we have, what would have happened in the world? So that loss, that loss from them to George to Tyree is devastating, not just for families, but for a whole people and for a country and for the world. So there is much to be said and wailed 
about. And because of that, to say, uh, one, once our tears are a little drier, we need to do something to see that this doesn't happen anymore. And so this is why those kinds of gatherings and that kind of speech is so, so important. Thank you. Uh, one of the questions that's come up in the chat is uh, the, the significance of both women and men in the, in the steal away meetings, preaching the gospel and how that, how, what that means for how we understand about the preacher for today. Yeah, yeah, very important. I, it's very significant that in Beloved, right, Toni Morrison's character, the preacher, is a woman, right? Baby Suggs. Uh, she preaches to the, you know, as they, as they said, so Baby Suggs with the word holy attached to her name, right? Where the people recognized that she is a person who was guided by the divine and has come to lead us in in these in these in this work of reclaiming our humanity and recognizing you know ourselves as imago dei the church that i serve is named after sojourner truth right who who preached at a time when women were prohibited from 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 being preachers right she couldn't have a pulpit so she sojourned she walked across many states and every town that she went to she preached to however many people she could. And it was interesting, one of the stories is that there was a man who followed her who was so upset <laughs> by the fact that she was actually, you know, preaching and carrying the Bible and actually uh, baptizing. He, he, he decided he would follow her and then wherever she went and started talking, he would try to interrupt her and, or speak against what she was doing. And, and he followed her long enough to be converted by her and baptized. <laughs> he must have been really listening. <laughs> yeah, the spirit moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> Don't it? <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Well, Reverend Hassan, we are so grateful uh, for your contribution this afternoon. Uh, as Barbara mentioned at the beginning, all during the month of February, during Black History Month, we're focusing on uh, the, the trajectory of African-American worship. And so you've helped us focus on, on preaching in some very prophetic and insightful ways. And we are deeply, deeply grateful. Next week, we're gonna have Dr. Sonia Caldwell Hereford uh, Dr. Hereford has carried on an esteemed career in terms of uh, academic leadership of developing uh, a variety of skills in, in, the, in music, but also in the church as well. Um, and so she's going to be with us to help us think about the importance of music and singing, uh, of rhyme and rhythm. Uh, in the context of African-American worship. So we look forward to having you um, on with us next week. Uh, we are uh, attempting to make sure that Dr. Hereford can be here on campus. And if that's the case, then uh, the broadcast of next week's convocation will take place via YouTube. We'll send out a link um, on Thursday morning. For those of you who are on campus, you'll be invited to uh, be present in Marwick Hall and uh, we'll, we will inform you. And again, for those of you who are off campus, you can access um, the presentation electronically. And, and tell your friends, uh, if you've listened in this morning today, tell your friends about this. Let's expand the conversation as we continue during um, this important month of discussions with our weekly convocation. Again, Reverend Hassan, may the peace of Christ be upon you. May God's spirit rest in you and on you, especially as you proclaim the good news of Jesus. We are most grateful. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really appreciative of you uh, and your invitation and hospitality. And I wanna say hello to uh, Reverend Jones, wherever you are, God bless you. And uh, certainly thank Reverend Hughes for, for her leadership.
You were marvelous. Um, God bless you. If I if I may say, Reverend Hughes is on her way home, but she's oh, doing good. things are oh, good. good. She texts me. This is her daughter, um, Reverend Hughes too. Um, she is on her way home. <laughs> oh, that's well, great. Thank you. Thank that's you. A, thank that's you. a wonderful way to conclude thank this convocation with that good news. Well, yes. blessings to all of you, and we look forward to seeing you next week. All right. You. Take care. Yep. Peace of Christ. And also on you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good night. Did you write?